Hello everyone and welcome to another conversation on our coffee. Welcome to another conversation with Sarah. Uh, today I have a very special guest and you will see why. I was so keen to have her in my channel and um, without further introduction, welcome to Mistress Ivana Justice. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Uh, thank you very much for being here in my studio and for allowing us, myself and the viewers, the privilege of knowing you. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. Because it is, it is a great privilege. I'm so pleased to be in Romania. Uh, How do you like it? I love it. I love it. The people are so kind. The food is wonderful. Um, it's your first time? It's my first time. As Probably some of your viewers know uh, there's the International Femdom Summit mm -hmm. going on this week. Um, and we saw each other yesterday at the meet yes. and greet, and we started talking a bit. Uh, so I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for taking the time. The uh, honor is all mine. And um, we clicked so, so well yesterday, and the conversation just started, and I was so uh, excited to have this interview. I was looking forward uh, because we, it's important, like uh, like um, previous the, uh, interviews, you have seen that I invited um, friends or people that I know for a long period of time. But this gorgeous lady here, I don't know. So it will be um, the same process of discovery <laughs> as interesting as for you. So um, I want to start with the first question. Um, because the idea of my channel is to discover the woman behind the image. Oftentimes, it happens that um, behind the image, there is a great person. And we only show 5-10% on, on online. So, I, I would like to ask you, who are you? And who is the woman behind the image? All right. So the image for me uh, is very, very, what I portray on social media, for example, is very close to who I am. Uh, for those of you that follow me on Twitter or elsewhere uh, or read my blog, uh, I'm a very playful dom. I always say that I've always been a dom. I've always been someone that likes to take control, right. but I identify more as a kingster than as a dominatrix, okay. even though I've always been a leader. I think that comes secondary to the fact that I love to play, I mm -hmm. love sexuality and sensuality, uh, and I identify more... It, being a leader is natural for me. Right. So the title of dominatrix... Natural. It's mm -hmm. just how it is. It's just a title. When it's when just a title, right? Yeah. Exactly. I've always been a leader in my previous careers uh, because I've had many, I've done many, many things in my previous careers. We'll I've talk always, about yeah. that. <laughs> I've always uh, been the one that's been in control because it comes so naturally for me. Um, but more than that, I'm very playful and exploring sensuality and sexuality through play, mm -hmm. BDSM, uh, is how I find joy. Lovely. Where are you coming from? So I'm originally from the United States, and I'm originally from the West Coast, mm -hmm. and I've been living in Paris for about the last seven years, just a little over seven years. So wow. I made my home in France. Such a huge cultural shift. Indeed. Uh, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of things to get used to. Um, when I first moved to France, I didn't know that I was going to stay. Uh, I said, I'm going to give myself six months. I want to learn the language. I want to learn a, a bit about the culture. I want to reconnect to my heritage. Mm -hmm. um, I have French heritage, and I wanted to reconnect with that. And I said, I'll stay for six months. If I like it, great. I can stay a bit longer. If I don't like it, I'll go back to the U.S. Uh, seven years later, I'm still there. <laughs> I've made my life there. Okay. Uh, and I just love it. What do you love? What is the, big, um, the biggest difference? that you, you found and it was challenging for you. Yeah, so there were some there were some big challenges. Uh, I always say that in the US it's really easy to meet people. You go to a bar, you go to uh, a club and all of a sudden you have 20 new best friends but you never call each other after that night. Mm -hmm. You meet, you spend a lot of time together that evening, you tell them your life story, you become really close but then there's no connection afterwards. In France it's quite the opposite. 
it takes a really long time to get into that inner circle, mm -hmm. but once you're in, you're in for life. Okay. So that was a really big, uh, it was very difficult, especially because I didn't speak the language well when I arrived. Was it, was it difficult to adjust because of the language or did you have any difficulty because of other aspects? It was primarily, primarily the language. I think that uh, I'm someone that's very open. Uh, yeah. I love talking to people. I love, you know, we met yesterday mm -hmm. and it was, I love discovering people. So I think that it was largely in part due to the language barrier because I couldn't, I, I wasn't able to speak French very well. And the French are not exactly known for speaking excellent English. So there was a, that a really uh, strong barrier there. Uh, the culture in France is just marvelous. And it, it, it's culturally rooted, you know, very, very rich. The history is very rich. Uh, when, when you moved to France, were you already engaged into the BDSM? Yes. Or, yes. OK, tell me a little bit. How did you start it? Uh, this journey <laughs> uh, with my first boyfriend because I stuck candles in his butt. <laughs> okay, I was not expecting that. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, I've always been kiki. I've always had a sexuality that's been. What age was that? Oh, my f uh, first lover was at 16 years old. And when did you? When did you do that? <laughs> About 16 or 17 years okay, old. Okay, that's early. Okay, we tied each other up. Uh, we spit on each other, we spanked each other. Uh, there was a lot of elements in my sexuality that now I recognize as BDSM. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know what BDSM was, I didn't have that right. vocabulary, but there have always been elements of BDSM in my sexuality. Uh, wow, so so interesting. And it, what's interesting is that I also had this uh, practices, if mm -hmm. you want, and I did not know, I thought I'm like, the weird one because you know like i don't i'm interested in more than just vanilla mm -hmm. interactions and there you are <laughs> on the other <laughs> side of the <laughs> um how was it for you did, did you feel like uh, like i said uh i felt that i'm the weird one did you have this um not really. I think that I was drawn to people that also had a sexuality that was a little bit not vanilla. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my early sexual partners, uh, we were just wild kids discovering, discovering our own bodies, discovering the bodies of other people. And uh, I came from a community that was really kind of a hippie community, so mm -hmm. pretty open talking about sexuality compared to most of the U.S. And very curious. Uh, not just with sexuality, but just a curious group of people in general. Uh, a lot of experimentation um, in a lot of different aspects. Uh, so I, I was definitely aware of the fact that I was the most sexually driven of all my girlfriends. I was the first one to vibrate. I was the first one to go to a sex club. I was the first one uh, to participate in an orgy. I was, you know, so I was aware that m m my sexuality was a little bit farther along. Um, body pleasure was really important for me and I, I recognized that early. I never felt weird or shunned by my friends, for example, uh, fortunately, fortunately, because I come from a really Puritan country, the U.S. is not known for being very sexually open, but thankfully my group of friends, d despite the, the great porno that we produce, okay. it's kind of the, the that's, extremes. That's something new. Yeah. That's something new. Yeah. It's kind of the extremes. We see the, the hardest core porno coming out of the U.S., mm -hmm. but in general, it's a very uh, conservative country as far as sexuality goes. Conservative as in which, which sense? We don't talk about sex. Oh, really? We don't talk about sex. Okay. It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem, and it's one of the reasons that I moved to France. Uh, so, uh, if for you, it was helpful to have your friends around and the people... Uh, in order to be able to engage and explore. Otherwise, it would have been impossible, is this correct to say? Yes, I, I think that it would have been much, much, much more difficult. Uh, it was thanks to, thanks to my close friends uh, that I was able to explore that um, from a very young age. You know? So uh, again, from, from here, it's uh, one conclusion, a uh, very important conclusion, if you ask me, is like, be careful with whom you are surrounding yourself with. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I'm fortunate that the people that I was surrounded by 
uh, we're also open, we're also into exploring, mm -hmm. um, having amazing experiences, whether that was jumping off of cliffs, uh, whitewater rafting, uh, hardcore snowboarding. Uh, right. we, we, were, we were attention, we were, we were thrill seekers. We wanted adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And for me, a big part of that was uh, bodies, touching, okay. and, touching and being touched. So how was that with uh, with a society with a vanilla society? How was your interaction? Because sometimes uh, I know in in here in Romania there are still if you are being different, um, it's it's not that well seen. Let's put it like that. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone is promoting uh, the uniqueness. Everyone is promoting the be you. But when you indeed are your authentic self, uh, you know, let's just take on stick with what we know. That's absolutely true. That was absolutely true in the U.S. as well. So it's open. Yeah, it was absolutely. I wasn't going to tell my boss at work mm -hmm. what I was doing at home. Okay. Uh, it's not something that I could share openly, except for within my my group of close friends. Because of what it was judgment. Okay, judgment. so you're afraid of okay. Yeah, like everyone. Like I said, the US is a pretty conservative country. And we don't talk about sexuality. We don't talk about sexuality with our partners. That's a huge problem. We don't talk about sexuality with our children. Mm -hmm. Huge problem. Indeed. We and need we need to have these conversations. They are elementary, if you ask me, especially nowadays, where is the the option for everything to everyone, and there's like freedom. It's important to know what you choose, and especially when it comes down to kids and young generation. Absolutely, I think that it's really important that we change the narrative about sexuality, notably. Uh, alternative sexuality, mm -hmm. sexuality that's not vanilla, uh, which my sexuality has always been not vanilla. Uh, penetrative sex is not that interesting to me, mm -hmm. uh, it's except it fits me penetrating the other right. person. Switching the roles. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, but traditional vanilla missionary style sex doesn't interest me all that much. Uh, I want to scratch and bite and lick and kiss uh, and already that is kind of what we would see as alternative sexuality right. uh, just spending time with someone discussing talking dirty for example mm -hmm. uh, like i mentioned my first sexual partner we did all sorts of wild kinky things at the time i didn't know that it was bdsm now looking back i recognize that there was no ds element but there was mm -hmm. a lot of uh, Play and activity. Play and activity that, that, that now I can see there were, there were elements of, of BDSM. Uh, and the fact that we don't talk about alternative sexuality. Already, it's difficult to talk about providing safe sex options. Mm -hmm. That's already like, wow, let's talk about condoms. And that's a big breakthrough that we yes. that, that's gotten better lately. But the, we, we talk, talk about condoms, but we don't talk why do we need to use condoms and like go fully indulge in this conversation. It's just like at the beginning, you need to protect yourself, which is the message that we are uh, sending also. But you need to understand why and you need to understand what are you doing and um, what are you about to do. You know, because uh, sex is not just sex. You know, it's so much more. Just like exactly, here. exactly. Just like BDSM is, just like fandom is. Is I like to say that uh, everything is like ninety percent psychology and just ten percent physical activity. I always Do you agree with that. Absolutely. I always say practices aren't interesting. This is what's interesting mm -hmm. with BDSM. Uh, I'm a sadist, uh, I love to play, but <laughs> the gorgeous whips and floggers and chains that we see around, that is one yes. small component yes. of BDSM. What's interesting in BDSM is relationships. And we were talking a little bit yeah. just before yeah. uh, we started filming here uh, about the relationships and the love that we have for our submissives. Mm -hmm. uh, I have profound relationships. I have very, very intimate relationships with, with some of my subs. I care deeply for them. Uh, 
Right, it's, it's part of our life, first of all, and part of us until a certain point because they are an extension of us. Mm -hmm. They are our, uh, our mirror mm -hmm. sometimes. Absolutely. And they're a mirror that allow us to reflect on how we can be better with it. Mm -hmm. That's something that I, I think we don't talk about too much. When I do something good for my subs, it makes me want to do even better. And when I do something bad for my subs, it makes me want to improve. And I think we don't give credit to those relationships often enough. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, yes, my subs are there to serve me. Yes, they are there for my pleasure. But I also want to be a better woman for them. For them. It makes me want to strive mm -hmm. and I want to be the best I can for them. Because I love them. Because I care for them. Even though I beat the heck out of them, even <laughs> though, you know, they leave bloody and bruised and broken. Uh, it's because, of course, there's consent mm -hmm. and there's mutual trust. Yes. Uh, Everything in BDSM, in um, the, the safe BDSM, the proper BDSM, is sane, safe, and consensual. There is no... Um, the no is no. Um, between engaging, there's... Conversations, all um, honest, open conversation without any um, hidden details. Everyone is, this is why I'm take it or leave it, match it or not, and then move mm -hmm. on, you know. So let's talk about relationship because it, it's, it's a, a topic very um, little discussed or uh, only a uh, few have approached it and it's still something that the majority, especially the vanilla society, do not understand. How is it like? It, if you love someone, you don't beat. It, that's that quote. I only I've heard beat that people so I love. Times. I only beat people I love. Uh, if I don't have confidence in the person, if I don't care for them, I'm not going to... What I think the general public doesn't recognize is that there is no abuse in a, in a healthy BDSM relationship. Mm -hmm. I only beat people that need it, that want it, mm -hmm. or that are doing it for my pleasure. Uh, but again, but as also said, given that is consensual. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. The only uh, we often say torture, torture, torture. There's no torture in BDSM, and this is something that I think we need to talk about yes. much more. There is no torture in BDSM, in safe BDSM, SSC, safe mm -hmm. and consensual BDSM. Uh, there's no torture because it's consensual. Me and my submissive have agreed on uh, our limits, mm -hmm. what's going to be okay for our next session, for our next play, for when we're out to lunch. Uh, so there, we need to take, I, I think we need to redefine what torture means within yes. the framework of BDSM. Yes. Because what we're doing is done with love and benevolence and care uh, and mutual respect, yes, I'm going to spit and hum spit on my sub, I'm going to humiliate him, I'm going to kick him in the balls. Why? Because I think it's funny. Uh, and because he wants it. <laughs> and he enjoys it. And uh, even though it, we put him as dominant, we put them in, in a difficult or what it might be seen as difficult situation, that doesn't mean we don't respect them. Of course. That doesn't mean we don't love them. And that doesn't mean they are our doormat. Yes, and I don't want a doormat. And me neither. Uh, <laughs> I don't want a doormat. If the person isn't able to tell me no, I always say no is sexy. No is mm -hmm. sexy. If it's someone a red tells flag. me no, it's a red flag. Absolutely. Me. Absolutely. If someone says, oh, I'm no limits, mm -hmm. I don't want to play with you. There is no, there is no such person that has no limits. Mm -hmm. there, it doesn't exist. Everyone, every person has a certain limit. Absolutely. I, I think that we also need to talk about the fact that people that are newer to the scene don't recognize their limits. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine that when you, uh, when you have a new sub, there's a, some sort of process yes. going into it, yes. a questionnaire or something like yeah. that, intake intake questionnaire. If I see no limits on the questionnaire that I receive... Rejection. Rejection. I, I don't even read the whole application. Yeah. Uh, I think that new people uh, tend to not know their limits and it's okay to say, I don't know what my yeah. limits are. It's actually healthier to say, I don't know. 
Absolutely. rather than I have no limit. Um, and w I'm curious, uh, and until now I haven't um, found the answer. Why do you think men in general, because women uh, are more aware of this and women tend to be uh, more open and give more details. Um, why do you think men are like, I have no limits? I think, I, think, I think it's a pride thing. I think they want to be the best. Mm -hmm. They want they want to conquer everything, even submission. Okay. Uh, I think that they're, you know it's kind of a strange thing because they're there to be led. You know, men in general contact me. Uh, I unfortunately have very few women clients. I would love for that to change, but generally speaking, the people that contact me are are male. Uh, and I think that even within the framework of BDSM, they have this like ego about wanting to do everything and wanting to be the best sub. Uh, I think that that's the the society implementations uh, of the men, of that image of men have to be great. You have to be man enough. And so from my perspective, again, it's my, my perspective, uh, that tends to translate in all the aspects of their life. Uh, when engaging you don't have to pretend you don't have to be no one else and nothing else but who you are absolutely the only thing that i ask is that you're vulnerable mm -hmm. that, like it's okay to be vulnerable uh within the walls of my dungeon the justice room mm -hmm. that is the safest place to be vulnerable right. it the, the the space is constructed to accept all emotions Mm -hmm. You know, what happens within the four walls of my dungeon uh, is safe and I want vulnerability and I want fear, uh, fear of being vulnerable, mm -hmm. not, not mm -hmm. real fear, you know, but mm -hmm. I want men to be able to expose themselves uh, with me mm -hmm. because it's beautiful when they do. It's, it is. It's it is. so glorious when a man uh, unveils himself. They're so, uh, they are like a flower that is blossoming. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, and you see each petal, like it, it becomes, with each interaction is more and more and more and more. And as a boy, for, for me, in my, in my case, actually, I'm like, where will this flower, how big this flower will be? It can be, it will keep growing. Yes. That's the wonderful thing about uh, relationships in general is it will just keep growing. There is no end to that once we have trust uh, and care and love. Right. So tell me about you. Let's, let's switch a little sure. bit and be back to, to you, the, the person, the woman <laughs> that you are. Um, what is your background? Uh, my background grew up in the restaurant industry and pursued okay. a career as a chef for a long time. So I have two big passions in my life, mm -hmm. uh, sexuality or sensuality, whatever you want to call it, uh, sex uh, and food. Those are, okay. <laughs> those are my two big things. So for those of you that follow me already on Twitter or, or elsewhere, you'll see that I love to travel, but I, I travel to eat. I, I live to eat. Do you uh, have a favorite dish? No. 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 Or whatever's in front of me. Okay. <laughs> that's the... <laughs> my favorite food is the one that I'm eating right now. Uh, Do you like to cook? Are I you, love to cook. I are you the, uh, more of a yes type of person or a host type of person? Uh, more a host. I love hosting. Uh, my, my perfect day uh, is waking up in the morning, maybe going to a yoga class, something like that, going to the, going to the beautiful open air markets in Paris, doing my shopping, oh, no, and spending the afternoon in the kitchen and waiting for my friends to arrive for dinner. Oh, look, are you, are you married? Do you have a relationship? Or? Yes, uh, not married, but uh, we, could, we could say that I'm married. It's, it's basically the same thing. Uh, okay. Mr. Justice, as I like to call him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're in, a, we're in a female led relationship. He should take my name, of course. So uh, you are in lifestyle. For you, it's a lifestyle. It's not just a job. Uh, not just a job. job. Okay. No. Uh, I'm both pro and lifestyle. I actually started lifestyle and transitioned mm -hmm. into professional dom. And, I, I also did that. And I yeah. think majority of the lifestylers, if it's even our lifestylers, yes. um, that's how they started. First with the lifestyle, trying, experimenting, and then going into the professional side. Um, 
Tell me how is the dynamic, the female relationship dynamic going in France? So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Justice is not my sub. But we are clearly in a female-led relationship. Okay. He's not submissive. He's a kinkster. Mm -hmm. uh, he has completely different kinks than I do. Um, for example, I'm, I'm very SM-oriented mm -hmm. and very service-oriented uh, in my DS relationships. Those are not things that he likes. He's not masochistic by any means. That said, it's definitely me that runs the house. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's me that makes all the big decisions. I'm, I'm definitely the go-getter in the relationship. It's clearly a female-led relationship without having DS uh, components. And how, even from, from here, I, I see one aspect that you both are different and at the same time, you have a wonderful relationship, which means if the communication is good and um, the interest is there, the genuineness is there, everything is possible. Sometimes I, I like to, uh, to post on, uh, on my social media that there is no such thing as not compatible. Just need to discuss, need to accept each other. Was it difficult for you to accept your, your partner, Mr. Jack? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think because we, we met at a munch and then the next night we saw each other at a play party. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we met in a context that was that was kinky. Okay. So that really helped a lot. Um, the communication was very open from the beginning. So I always say I'm 80% lesbian and 40% heterosexual. I was not at all looking for a partner, first mm -hmm. off. I was looking for a male partner even less. And a non-submissive male partner was like, <laughs> no, no chance, <laughs> no way. Uh, but we fell in love. Uh, you know, things happen. Sometimes it's it's completely unexpected. Uh, and indeed, the communication has been wonderful from the get-go because I think it was easy because we started as, as lovers without yeah. having any without the pressure. Yeah, we, we neither of us were looking for a relationship. Uh, we just wanted to have fun, and, and so there was no hidden agenda, mm -hmm. uh, either on my part or on, on his part. Um, so it made for communication from the beginning really easy, uh, because yeah. it was like, oh, okay, we fell in love really quick. Uh, but the fact that we met in a context that was kinky really helped a lot. He's a photographer, uh, wow. and our, our first date, uh, it was at the beginning of my career as a pro dom mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our first date was a photo shoot together. Oh, and that's so lovely. <laughs> that's so lovely. It's interesting because um, more or less the, the majority of relationships um, in the SM uh, world uh, starts some sort of a kinky part, um, um, party uh, munch or within this environment is like Rarely you will see uh, vanilla interacting or developing. Right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the the long term uh, relationships that I see around me, uh, whether they're DS or just kinky relationships, generally do start at events. And for those of you, uh, something I really want to encourage for those of you that are looking for a lifestyle partner, get out of your house and start going to events. Oh, God, <laughs> quit looking at your yes. computer. Yes. Quit sending yes. me DMs. Uh, quit sending Sarah DMs. Go to a munch. Go to play parties. Get out there. Explore. It's something that drives me absolutely crazy. When and I'm sure you too. Um, I I don't pay attention anymore because uh, I rarely have time to read my DMs. <laughs> but my mails I always read them. But indeed, it, it's such a gold advice that you gave. Go out there, expose yourself, uh, get out of your comfort zone. If you're staying in in, in front of your PC, you will never you never experience. You will get some sort of informations, but until you will try by, for yourself, you will not know. Absolutely. Each person has its own journey, its own experience, its own way of, its own perspective. Absolutely. And it's not behind your computer screen that you're going to find Definitely that. Not. Go visit ProDoms. You know, if, if, if that's, you know, if you want to explore kink, visiting a ProDom is a really good way to explore kink in a safe, mm -hmm. nurturing environment.
Uh, go visit protons if you want to play, if you just want to play. If you're looking for a relationship, Visit a pro dom a lot. Visit the one that you're in love with a lot. <laughs> and it can, I, I know that uh, all my lifestyle subs uh, started as clients. And uh, one important aspect of uh, visiting a pro dom is that you will have the proper experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you will not, the, the risks are less. Indeed, there are risks all the if time. If you go to a good pro dom, if yes. you go to a reputable, yes. someone with a good skill, reputation, skill, experience, it's like compare with if you are playing with, I don't know, uh, someone that you just met on social media or stuff, you might end up having a bad experience uh, and not fully understand what is it, and then you're making this impression like, okay, this is not for me. And sometimes you can miss a lot of, you cannot uh, discover yourself because of this bad experience. So it's important where do you start your journey also now, and with whom? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we're going to talk about my writing, but this mm -hmm. is kind of a good segue in, in, into that. Um, I write a lot about finding a good pro dom and of course, I want to meet wonderful people and I want you to come see me and I want to see if we're compatible. But I have a lot of advice on my website uh, talking about mm -hmm. finding the right pro dom for you. Finding someone that's compatible with your kinks, with your desires. Quit looking at pictures and read about the person. Very important. Pictures will not tell you all the information. They, they read what is behind the picture also. Uh, you know, when, when we look at relationships of couples that have been together for 50 years, they're not, uh, oftentimes, one of the people will say, oh yeah, when I met her, I didn't find her attractive. When I met him, I didn't find him mm -hmm. attractive. But now he's the most beautiful person that I've right. ever known. Right. Because the, the bonds that they've created over time make that person beautiful. Truth be told, when I met Mr. Justice, I wasn't like, oh my God, he's so sexy. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's okay. okay, you know. But it, it wasn't like it wasn't like, oh, he's like the sexiest guy ever. I was like, oh, he's not bad looking. It, it's never, it's never the sexy guy. Yeah, it's never. No. But you know, <laughs> the, now he's the sexiest man on the planet. For you, now, yes. now yes. he's like, mm, yummy. Uh, <laughs> I find him super sexy uh, because uh, you weren't stopping yourself at his aspect. You saw what's behind again behind the image. It's it's a it's a very important aspect. Take time to get to know a person. Absolutely. Don't stop just oh he's so sexy. She's so beautiful. She's like there's much more. There's so much more. There's so much more. So much more. And because you you brought up the the subject, uh, I can't stop myself. What is this <laughs> book about? Let me, let me, I go ahead. You can hear this book. You can see it's dominatrix. Uh, you have to go and get it. I'm not making like a, a commercial. You're not paying <laughs> it, but still, like um, I truly recommend it. And I think everyone that is within the um, king community, if you are not only a uh, femdom, but they have to have this. I Tell me about this book. I think even people outside of the king community need to read this book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not just saying that because I wrote so it. So it's not only for the community? My dream is that this book is on the bookshelf of every uh, housewife in the world so that she can learn a little bit more about her sexuality, mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about taking power, uh, about assuming power in her relationship. Uh, and I think that this book really does a good job of that. So uh, the book is called The Heart of the Dominatrix. Uh, if you follow me, you've seen my endless posts about it. It's uh, portraits and interviews with 21 uh, dominatrices from it's around the world. Thick. It's, it's quite thick. It's quite thick. It's a, it's a big book. It's a beautiful coffee table book. For those of you that can't have the coffee table book, uh, there's also an ebook available uh, on the website, Heart of the Dominatrix. Um, so it's, it's interviews that I conducted right after lockdown in France. Uh, so it's a pandemic project. <laughs> pandemic <with> project. <laughs> it's interesting uh, what the mind can come up with when it has a moment of quietness. Yeah. So when you stop, this yeah. showed up. I was uh, at dinner with a couple of girlfriends. Uh, both of them are also pro-doms. 
uh, pro and lifestyle book. Mm -hmm. And both of them are also writers. Uh, and we were just talking and I was like, I've got an idea. I'm going to interview a bunch of dogs and I'm going to write a book. They're like, ah, oh, it's a great idea. Uh, I'm the kind of person that takes on projects when I don't know what I'm doing. And this was a perfect example. I know what you're saying. I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is a great idea. I have no idea how to do it. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, almost two years later, it was about two years of work, just a little less than two years of work, uh, to put it out. Um, it was a huge project. So I contacted women. Some of them uh, I had already been in contact with, uh, but I really contacted specialists. I always. This is Wait, the book. Yeah, so the book again, Heart of the Dominatrix. So, you can see. It's available it on Amazon. Pictures, lot. Gorgeous pictures. It's right. a gorgeous. Very well documented. Uh, I read a little bit about it. I haven't ordered it yet, but I will order it soon. Um, I want to ask what was the first interview? Where so I contacted a couple of women that I knew uh, in person. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in here perfect. so you can. Uh, Maitresse Blanche, who is a good girlfriend, who's mm -hmm. a MedFet specialist, uh, ABDL specialist, and she actually has three specialties, ABDL, uh, adult baby diaper leopard, for those of you that don't know, uh, medical fetishism, and also really hardcore leather, uh, kind of traditional BDSM, what we see mm -hmm. as traditional BDSM. She was one of the first person, one of the first people that I contacted, along with Elise Uriel, who is another French woman that was in Hong Kong, uh, they're women that I know in real life, so it was easy for me to approach them mm -hmm. about the project. When I first started, I didn't know if it was going to be successful. I didn't know <clears throat> what the um, if women were going to be willing to do these interviews uh, because it's not your traditional interview. Because I'm a lifestyle and pro dom, I went a little bit deeper than what was your first session like mm -hmm. or what's your favorite kink. I asked questions like, "Is being a dominatrix?" Intrinsically political. Yeah. Uh, do you believe in matriarchy? Not everybody in the book does. Not everybody. Which is which is fine. Which, which is, is fine. great. Yes. So there's 21 women featured from all around the world. Uh, there's 15 different countries represented, six continents, um, including Romania. Including so. Romania, <laughs> indeed. Uh, Isarisen, for those of you uh, involved in the BDSM community, you've probably at least heard the name, unless you've been living under a rock. It's impossible. <laughs> Um, we so say hello. Hi, Isabel. Isabel. <laughs> Thanks for having us here, having me in Romania this week. Uh, so Isabel is one of the women that's featured, uh, but there's women from all over the world, and each of their stories is vastly different. Uh, there's one woman, one French woman, uh, that's a she's a horse. She identifies as a horse, and she's a horse trainer also. Yeah, we discuss this. Exactly. I just tell the story. Maybe one day I will have her in in my interview. She's so I will... fascinating. Uh, she's a kingster. She's been in the scene for since the eighties. Uh, yeah, she's been around forever, and she's a woman that I know well uh, from events. And uh, she's she wears latex everywhere. She's like she goes grocery shopping in latex. The woman is a kinkster to the bone. Wow. Uh, and she identifies as, as a horse, uh, and she also trains horses with her partner. Uh, so her partner is, uh, he's a count or something like that. Uh, he's got some like ooh, so title. So and, uh, and it's just so fascinating. Um, there's, the specialties range from hypnosis, erotic hypnosis, to sports training. There's one woman that does uh, sports coaching within the framework of BDSM. She uses okay, a punishment and reward system. And it's so fascinating. So fascinating. I might need to we'll go and visit her. Each <laughs> time I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go tomorrow. I'm going to start tomorrow. And it never starts. Yeah. So yeah. I went. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for some people, it really works. I, Was it, a, a, I assume that you read all the interviews. Was it something that impacted you? Of course. Can, of course. You, can you give us? Absolutely. I think I, when I was asking these questions, it also made me ask myself the same questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course their stories changed me. Um, I'm thinking of Madame Marguerite, who is a pet play specialist, uh, animal, uh, animal training uh, specialist, and I wasn't face out when I was writing the book. I, for, for personal reasons, I wasn't face out. Uh, I was face out in my private life. It's kind mm -hmm. of funny. I was face out in my private life, but Imana wasn't face out. 
Okay. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too much. And she said something that I really appreciated um, because I, I acted, I'm an activist for, for sex worker rights. Mm -hmm. And she goes, if, if, we're, if we don't show our face, how can we be an activist? Wow. And I was just so like, powerful. oh, shit. <laughs> so, powerful. so powerful. Like, if we, if we don't show ourselves, how can we... How can we be politically, uh, I don't remember exactly how she said it, but I just went, well, okay, now's the time. Selfie! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mm. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised because even my idea of this channel, it started more or less from that area. Mm -hmm. We need to educate people. Of, we of need course. to let them know from inside, not from outside. Because there are a lot of uh, magazines, a lot of uh, even movies nowadays, and but the idea that they and the information that they provide sometimes is not the real one, the genuine one, and it's more as a uh, because it sells as a commercial wise, when in fact things are so much. Uh, go so much deeper and have a, a, a different meaning sometimes even uh, the dynamics are totally different it, it comes into my mind now a very famous uh, a movie about a very rich millionaire I'm not gonna say the name <laughs> uh, and you know and it's, it's important to say at least I don't stand behind it I don't support it because apparently it's just like it's missing the consensuality right so back to our to our book. What was um, what were you thinking in the moment that you were composing and analyzing the? Um, it was such a long and intricate process. There were so many things that were going on. Uh, I I talk openly about the fact that the the lockdown was extremely difficult for me. Uh, for everyone, even for me, it was. Yeah, I'm I'm someone that's extremely extroverted. Uh, the fact that Mr. Justice was the only body that I touched for three months was really difficult for me. Uh, and so I think I was coming out of that period because it was, it was just after the first lockdown. I think that I was so thirsty to make connections again. And we, we, still, had, uh, we still had a curfew. Uh, we couldn't be out past uh, 7 p.m. Uh, we still had a lot of limitations. We couldn't travel more than 200 kilometers from where we lived. And I think that my, my desire to connect people, which is something that I do in everyday life also, uh, was really, really strong. So that, that was the first goal of the book, was like, I want to create a new community, a community that doesn't exist. Uh, I want to bring these women together. Uh, that was definitely one of the and things. Such a beautiful way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'm so thankful for all the women in the book. There's something that I want to mention really quick, because I think, that, I think that it's really important to talk about uh, this is a project by women for women. Uh, the cover art was done by, uh, it's, a, it's a woman photographer that did the cover. The, the cover designer was also a woman. The woman that did the uh, interior design is a woman. 10% uh, of the sales, which as a writer, we don't make much money. Trust me. The book <laughs> so, is expensive. The book is really expensive, but that's because the printing costs. It's a gorgeous object. It is. It's it is. A, it, we don't make much money. That being said, 10% of the profits are, are going back to the women that are in the book because I wanted it's it's a collaborative mm -hmm. effort. It was a community. A way to say thank you. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're part of it. It's gonna be like six euro per person. <laughs> but the, the, it doesn't matter the gesture. The comes. idea. It was really important for me to uh, keep that community mm -hmm. in mind. Uh, that. It's thanks to them that the book exists. I didn't do any writing. Okay. I, I, I wrote very little. Uh, I edited. But you I edited. read a lot. <laughs> I, I read and I, I, I cut and pasted things and I completely changed the structure of things. I was an editor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the cover, it, it doesn't say written by an out of justice. It says composed by, compiled right. by. Right, right. Because okay. the women were the ones that wrote the book. I just took usually the women, and I will take this what you said in extended. Usually, the women make life, make the life. I, do you agree with of that? Of course, of course. Even physically, that's that's, and they gave birth to this mm -hmm. to this gorgeous book. 
which I hope to later turn into a documentary with Mr. Justice, who's, who's an amazing filmmaker. Uh, if you want to go see my gorgeous, really artistic Fembom videos, they're all on my website for free. Just go. What is your website? InanaJustice.com. So I N A N N A Justice J U S T I C E dot com. Uh, we'll, we'll put the Hope link. You, you know that yeah. we, we will definitely. So is it correct to say that this book is just a stepping stone towards a much greater project? Absolutely, absolutely. It was such a wonderful process. Uh, I learned so much. When we, you know, like you, if we start on a project and we don't know what we're doing, we don't realize the magnitude. Yes. I did not think I was going to spend a year and a half putting this thing together. I was like, oh, it's going to be really easy. They're going to send me the responses really quick. And they're going to send me the photo release forms really quick. And all the photos are going to be perfect. And they're going to be high enough quality. No. A lot of the photos that I was sent uh, were taken with an iPhone uh, or another, you know, mm -hmm. some, some sort of telephone. Uh, so they weren't high enough quality for a print book. Thank goodness I have Mr. Justice in my life who went back through and mm -hmm. used artificial intelligence to retouch the photos. And wow, yeah. So technology <laughs> was present. Yeah. Also. He, he spent. He he's my number one fan. He's my biggest biggest supporter uh, in all the things that I undertake, uh, and he was a huge help in the book. So. One of the few men that was allowed to contribute to the book. Uh, <laughs> in a small percentage. <laughs> he also took some of the pictures that were in the book. He, oh, he, lovely. Yeah. Uh, was it something that you learned composing uh, on a personal level while creating this piece of art? Because it is a piece of art. Something that I learned, I don't know, but I, it, it certainly reinforced the fact that I am not patient at all. Uh, I set a deadline, I set a first deadline, please send me back the questionnaires, the photo release forms, mm -hmm. and the photos before, I don't remember, I think it was April 1st or something like that. On April 1st, I think I had three interviews. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let's say beginning of June. Uh, I had seven interviews. I'm like, I can't write a book with seven interviews. Like, uh, I can publish something on my blog, but I, mm -hmm. I can't write a book. Uh, and then I pushed it back a third time. To, to get the final cut. Working um, with people is very difficult. It is. It, it is. is but it is challenging for you as a person yeah. also. And especially, you know, the, these are all dominatrices. I can't chase after them and be like, I'm going to whip you if you don't do this. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you have these are colleagues and other strong women, <laughs> and they're all really busy. And what I asked of them was a lot of work. Uh, there was 65 questions on my questionnaire. It was Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't just like... It wasn't a short thing. 10 uh, minutes interview. They had, the, they had the option to respond to some or all mm -hmm. of the questions. Some, some women responded to five questions, but they responded... They In developed uh, really well their, their questions. Others responded to 50 questions, but their responses were mm -hmm. a little bit shorter. So my job was to remix that uh, and make it look... Like, uh, congratulations once yeah, again I congratulate yeah, you thank yesterday you. and I want to do it uh, even now this is a piece of art in, in in my perspective and I think like I said everyone should have it um, where can they buy it? Amazon okay. so the website is heartofthedominatrix.com that will give you a link to buy the ebook please buy the ebook directly from the website because mm -hmm. it's much more expensive on Amazon and we make a lot, a lot less money if you buy it on Amazon it's 35 euro on Amazon for the okay. ebook, and it's 15 euro directly on the website. So for those of you that can't have the gorgeous object. Uh, so it can be ordered internationally. It can be ordered internationally. Uh, Amazon, uh, regardless of what country you're in, there's only a few countries where it's, mm -hmm. you, you can't get it. But uh, basically all over the world. Um, Heart of the Dominatrix is the book. I Go and get it. Go and get it. <laughs> now, I want to uh, go back to you. <laughs> Uh, is there a before and after BDSM of, of you? Even though you, you said you started very early. I started really early. Yes, there, there, was, there was before the book that you mentioned mm -hmm. a little bit earlier that okay. we won't talk about. That was my introduction to the vocabulary of BDSM. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought the book when it came out about 12 or 13 years ago in the U.S. The summer that it came out, I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to read that. I spent the afternoon on my couch 
It was a hot summer day. I spent the afternoon on my couch. I devoured the book. I, I read it all in an afternoon, and I was like, BDSM. So I went on the computer, <laughs> and I found FetLife. Okay. Uh, and it just it, it opened up my world. Uh, like I said, there was always elements of kink. And I don't know how I never heard the term BDSM or how it never registered with me before that. Because I was reading Anne Rice. I was, I, I, I was reading a lot of things that were really really BDSM-ish, uh, but I didn't have that vocabulary, and it was thanks to that that terrible book. Okay. Uh, the book itself has a story. It's, it's just interesting. I read it, and I read it like constantly. I couldn't yeah. stop myself, but still, like, the idea, it's it, it's tricky. Yeah. Of course. I read it, you know, 12 or 13 years ago. I don't remember it that well, truth be told. I, I you know, being in the community now, I know that it's problematic. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take the time to reread it. I have no interest in rereading it. I'm thankful to that book that it opened up my world. You know, right. as many negative things as we say about it. And I think that's the case for a lot a lot of people. Yes. Uh, yes. I've it, heard that. Oh. Yeah, that it, that it opened doors for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, great. Yeah, it was a shitty book. Uh, there's a lot of shitty books. Uh, <laughs> but it's like the we appreciate the, the openness mm -hmm. of being there and shocking literally but uh then don't 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 do what he says in, in that book first uh, educate yourself yes. first learn what you're engaging in make sure you fully understand what you're engaging in and then start playing and doing stuff and be wild right uh what are your hobbies uh, sex, food, <laughs> sex, food. <laughs> That's an interesting. I'm, so I'm, long. <laughs> I'm so busy with all my projects. I'm really passionate about BDSM mm -hmm. uh, and power exchange and uh, and relationships. Um, my hobbies are often revolving around uh, around my work. Uh, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate. Uh, right now, I'm starting an association. I've just recently built two websites. I'm building a third website right now. I'm not a web developer. They're not very fancy websites, but it, it served the purpose. They serve, they serve the purpose. With, uh, with Mr. Justice, we we host a kinky event, a monthly kink event uh, that I just wrote a website for. So my the last month or so was um, writing for the website. Uh, I write a lot for my blog. Uh, so this will be only for friends area or like worldwide. The, the blog? Yes. The blog is available. And the, the organization. In the, uh, the, par the party that we host is in Paris. Okay. Uh, it's called the Kinky Saloon. So for those of you that are coming to Paris or that live in Paris, uh, look us up. It's it's not a femdom event. It's the only event that I organize that's not femdom. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a kinky party. It's a munch and play. So okay. we start the evening with uh, a couple of drinks, and then we do a uh, safety speech about consent. Um, and Still a little bit of education. Oh, of course. Oh, education is really important to me. Yeah, and then we do a, a short demo. Mm -hmm. uh, most of it, so I do one. I do one month out of two. So every other month we have another person that that comes in, uh, and sometimes it's about a practice. Sometimes it's about a philosophy. I did English education last month, uh, and then this month it's a girlfriend that's that's going to be doing the animation. Um, and then we open up the dungeon to play, so it's really fun. Oh, lovely! Yeah, sounds like uh, the future looks bright. Can indeed, I <laughs> indeed. Uh, I, I organize a lot of events, so I organize workshops on safety and security for pro doms, mm -hmm. uh, something that's sorely lacking in in the professional community, particularly. Yeah. Uh, so everything from first aid for for doms to how to properly strangle your partner, um, because mm -hmm. I see a lot of really bad practices happening. Uh, so I want to provide a safe space for for people to learn mm -hmm. this sort of stuff because we're going to do it. You know, we're not going to stop yes. doing yes. it. But how do we do things safely? Uh, uh, hygiene workshops. Uh, how do you properly clean sounds? Like, is biting someone safe? Like, what are the risks of biting mm -hmm. someone? Uh, because there are risks. So I, I organize a lot of workshops uh, on that. I also organize a small party, a really intimate femdom party called the Boudoir Infernal with two girlfriends. So it's three doms with six subs. Uh, and that we, sounds fun. It's so <laughs> much fun. And each time the theme changes. So the last time it was casino. Uh, 
Uh, okay. So the boys had to show up with uh, chocolate money. You know those little oh, boys? Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Chocolate. Chocolate. Chocolate money. Temptation. And chocolate they, they money lost, and yeah. like, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> perfect. <laughs> so each time the theme changes <laughs> for that. Uh, so I have a, a lot of my projects, uh, my hobbies are, they revolve around uh, the fan theme. team. I'm really busy. From where do you get all your inspiration in, in starting all this project? Hanging out with inspiring people. Okay. Uh, my, my closest friends are also pro-doms, um, but they're also uh, artists, uh, writers, painters, musicians. Uh, so I think that spending my time with people that are inspired outside of it's not just in the dungeon that mm -hmm. they're inspired. Uh, I'm a voracious reader. I read a lot. Uh, so literature is, is also somewhere where I get inspiration. Um, yeah. Okay. Also, what if something um, was... What did your son taught you on a personal level? I'm interested in, in the woman. That communication. You, okay. The importance of communication. And that there's nothing we can't talk about. I think that that's been the biggest gift that BDSM has given me, is that no subject is taboo if we go into it with love and care. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and that we should talk about everything, that we should talk about even the most difficult things. Even if it sounds silly or stupid, yeah. just let it all out, express it, talk about it, don't hold back. I've heard some crazy requests. Uh, even some kinks that are kind of common, uh, like uh, think about lunars, for example, balloon fetish. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that's crazy. Like and that's fun. <laughs> and it's so much fun and it's so wonderful. And watching someone get into their kink yes. is so wonderful. That's why I'm on voyeur. Sometimes and I just love to watch oh. and watch and watch and like, wow. Yeah, I've heard some crazy kinks. Uh, and, and it's so great. And I try to go into it with as little judgment as possible. I, I, I never say we're judgment free. I try to be as judgment free as possible. Of course, I, I, I'm human. Uh, I, I do judge. Uh, but with the, the but least work, amount work, possible. We work on that. We, we are working on our judgments. Yeah. And to, try to improve that, not to. Yeah. I, I, and I think uh, when we hear about uh, kinks that we've never heard of before, because even after 15 years of, well, even more than that, of lifestyle and five years of proton, there are still requests that I get that I'm like, oh, that's a first. There's always space there's, for new. There's and always you space. Always to learn. Uh, I'm constantly surprised and constantly uh, filled with joy and awe. Uh, about weird kinks like I think it's so fabulous that you want to be wrapped up in plastic bags and chew cheese and like <laughs> spit cheese on you like whatever <laughs> you being a, a lover of food would be like yeah. come here yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> totally. Uh, so um, at, um, to end this interview this beautiful interview um, I would like if possible for an advice from you to the people out there first for the women and then for men yeah i think i think that it would probably be the same for for both women and men it's be authentic and don't be ashamed if you feel different because we're all weird we're all weird in our own ways even if you're the most cookie cutter vanilla person uh, you've got something about you that's weird i promise embrace that uh, learn, learn to love your differences. Um, yeah, and be authentic with yourself, and then communicate. Communicate with your partners. Communicate with, with the people that you love. Um, and don't be scared. Get out there. Life, life is short, and it's made for living. Exactly, exactly. So live your life. Live your best life. Uh, I heard this recently. This. Uh, uh, phrase so I just loved it so live your life live your best life go outside of your comfort zone and thank you very much for this beautiful beautiful interview it was a great pleasure 
and I learn a lot from each person that I'm interviewing. I, I'm learning so, so many, as proof that each individual is so beautiful, so unique and amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah. And thank you also for watching. Um, check out um, the, that subscription button, subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you on, uh, on the next episode. Bye.